Another approach to thinking about disability is the rights model, which is primarily concerned with ensuring that disabled people are treated as equal members of society and have equal opportunities as able-bodied and minded people. Different people have different needs, and this means that treating people equally or giving people equal consideration, opportunities, and freedom does not mean treating everyone exactly the same or giving everyone the exact same amount and kinds of resources. Treating everyone the same and giving everyone the exact same resources would, in fact, mean that some people are underserved while others have things they do not need. Disability rights activists argue not that everyone should have identical treatment or the exact same resources, therefore, but that all people deserve equal consideration of their needs. Equal consideration may mean that some people receive more or different resources than others, but this is still equal treatment when we account for differences among people's needs and abilities. Here it is useful to introduce a distinction between negative rights and positive rights. Negative rights involve the rights to be left alone and to be free, to make decisions about one's own life without other people interfering unduly. Within the context of disability rights, negative rights entail such things as not being placed in an institution against one's will or not being subjected to a medical treatment that one does not consent to. In contrast, positive rights are more active, interventionist rights, such as the right to a service or a resource. For example, in order for disabled people to be fully and equally integrated into society, they may need particular services or resources that non-disabled people don't require. For instance, Jane's partner, Fiona, is able-bodied, and so she gets to school by riding her bicycle in the fall and getting a ride from a friend in the winter. In contrast, in the winter, Jane needs a wheelchair accessible vehicle to get to school, and the public transportation system in Edmonton is required to provide this. Public transportation buses have ramps, a kneeling front entrance, flip up seats for passengers with mobility devices, accessible stop request buttons, and a bus hailer kit for people with visual and cognitive impairments. While Jane needs an accessible vehicle to get to school, other disabled people may need a personal assistant, a seeing eye dog, or, like Peter, they may need ASL interpretation. Having the transportation one needs to get to school and the assistance and interpretation one needs to get an education are all positive rights for which disability activists have fought. It is important to stress that while Jane and Peter may need forms of assistance that are more conspicuous to the general public, this doesn't mean that Fiona, as an able-bodied person, is fully independent and autonomous, or even that she is more independent and autonomous than Jane. Indeed, none of us are fully independent and autonomous. On the contrary, in order for Fiona to bike or get a ride to school, she relies on the fact that someone has built bike paths between her home and the university, or that someone is driving the car for her. She relies on a bike mechanic to assemble her bike and fix it when it is broken, and she relies on a car mechanic to keep her friend's car running. Just like the accessibility features of the ETS buses are designed with bodies like Jane's in mind, Fiona's bicycle and her friend's car are designed with bodies like Fiona's in mind. Fiona's body is being accommodated as much as Jane's is, but this is just less obvious to many of us since she has what has been called in the critical disability studies literature a more normate body. Fiona also experiences a great deal of anxiety and seasonal depression and sometimes has issues with low self-esteem. Because of this, Jane's care and emotional support are often crucial in motivating her to get out of bed in the morning and to stay in school. Like Fiona, all of us rely on other people and on other animals as well, in a myriad of ways, whether able-bodied or not. None of us is fully independent or autonomous, and yet some forms of dependency are more visible and stigmatized than others. In the case of Fiona and Jane, it is the ways that Jane needs assistance and accommodation that are more visible and more stigmatized within society. These more visible and stigmatized forms of dependency are what get categorized as disabilities,
while other forms of dependency are either less apparent or are more normalized. Positive rights, then, in the case of disability, are active measures that need to be taken for a disabled person to access the full integration into society that is their due. As disability rights activists have argued, it should not be understood as charity to provide disabled people with the assistance they need, since it is their right to be given this assistance as equal members of society. This means that people whose work it is to assist disabled people should not be understood to do so out of kindness or generosity. Rather, these people are staff and people with disabilities have the right to be provided with the staff they need. Assistants are simply working and disabled people should be able to pick and choose them as any employer can do. The rights model of disability has been important for improving the lives and status of disabled people. For instance, it has been instrumental in passing the Americans with Disabilities Act in the US and the inclusion of disabled people as a protected group in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms in Canada. Due to the Americans with Disabilities Act and the inclusion of disabled people in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, failing to accommodate disabled people is not simply a failure to be charitable, it is discrimination and illegal. If a restaurant owner or employee tells a disabled person with a guide dog that they can't bring the dog into a restaurant, they are not just being uncharitable, they are breaking the law. Despite the importance of the disability rights movement and these legislative victories, one critique of the rights model of disability that has been raised by critical disability studies scholars and activists is that it usually does not question how we understand disability. Disability on the rights model is usually understood as a medical problem with individual bodies and minds. According to this model, certain people have medically problematic bodies and minds and so have the right to special accommodation. Although the rights model argues that such accommodation should be understood as a legal right rather than a charitable act, it doesn't question whether the problem is really located in individuals as opposed to in society, as do social models of disability and impairment we have seen earlier. Critical disability studies scholars and activists have also been critical of the fact that disability rights movements have been dominated by straight, white, middle-class disabled men, mostly with mobility impairments, who want to have the privileges of other straight, white, middle-class men Put otherwise, they want access to the social and economic power that they would have had as straight white middle class men if it weren't for their disability. By and large, these men have not been concerned with unraveling power, but simply with accessing power as it is in society. As some critical disability study scholars have put it, this is an ad ramps and stir approach. This critique of the mainstream disability rights movement is similar to a critique that has been made about mainstream feminism, particularly in the 80s and 90s. The feminist movement has historically been dominated by straight, white, middle-class women, and what they were fighting for was to have the same kinds of social opportunities and the same economic and political power that straight, white, middle-class men had. Mainstream feminism was historically not about unraveling power in any systematic way either, but was simply about the most privileged women trying to access the power that the most privileged men had. When these women spoke of women having equal rights with men, for example, they didn't mean that they wanted to switch their position with those of working class white men or black men, which were arguably worse than their own situations. Rather, they wanted to switch their position with that of middle-class white men, often without questioning racial, colonial, class, heterosexist, or ableist oppressions that intersect with systems of gender. Since the 90s, feminist scholarship and activism has become increasingly intersectional, meaning that it considers sexism along with other interlocking forms of oppression, such as racism, colonialism, heterosexism, class, and ableism. Just like mainstream feminism has been criticized for not concerning itself with women who were discriminated against for reasons other than their gender, 
the mainstream disability rights movement has been criticized for not concerning itself with the ways in which disability is often compounded by and interacting with racial, colonial, class, gender, or sexual oppression. Critical disability studies scholars and activists have thus argued that we should be concerned with unraveling the structures of power rather than simply moving already relatively privileged disabled people into even more privileged strata of society. This means going beyond a rights approach to disability and beyond thinking about disability in isolation. For these scholars and activists, what we need is an intersectional approach to disability, one that simultaneously attends to other aspects of social identity, such as socioeconomic class, gender, sexuality, race, and even animality, as these coexist and interact with disability. For example, it is important to think about disability and socioeconomic status or class together because the two are in causal relations. Poverty often entails poor health care or no health care and may also entail malnutrition and stress, undesirable, even dangerous jobs with high rates of repetitive strain and other injury, such as slaughterhouse and meatpacking work, are also done by poor people with few options, and thus poverty frequently leads to disability. Conversely, disability often means employment prejudice, and thus unemployment or underemployment, and thus downward mobility and poverty. While this gives a bit of a sense of how disability and class intersect and should be considered together, in the next several modules, we will consider further intersections of disability and socioeconomic status with gender, sexuality, race, and animality.